Timber Creek, can we welcome our Die Ball and Duncan units that are going to be worshiping with us? We're so glad you're here with us, guys. Let's join in time of worship. Here we go. We thank you, Lord. We say your word is a lamp unto my feet. Your way is the only way for me. It's a narrow, it's a narrow road that leads to life, but I want to be on it. It's a narrow road, the mercy's wide, because you're good on your promise. And together we say, we'll take you at your word. If you said it, I believe it. I've seen how good it works. If you start it, you'll complete it. I'll take you at your word. And the chaos fell in line Well, I know Cause I've seen it in my life It's a narrow road It's a narrow road That leads to life But I want to be on it Yes, Lord It's a narrow road The tide is high But you part in the water Said it, I believe it. I've seen how good it works. If you start in your complete, I'll take you at your word. If you said it, I believe it. I've seen how good it works. If you start. Nothing less than your very best today. 
Well, good morning, everybody. Good to see you. So glad to have you not only here at Lufkin, but in Mount Enterprise, in Nacogdoches, in Groves, Iglesia, Timber Creek, everybody online, our guys at the Duncan and Dieball units. We're so glad that you are joining us, and it's going to be a really, really good day. Two things. We are beginning a series of messages uh, introducing or reintroducing you to the Holy Spirit. And We ought to be on a first-name basis with the Holy Spirit. But also, as the church gets a little bigger, especially in this season of growth, like right now as school kicks off and we take this next semester, it's a time a lot of people, you know, uh, visiting church for the first time. And over the next few weeks, not only are we going to be talking about the Holy Spirit, who he is and who he isn't, what he does and what he doesn't, but also we want to get to be on a first-name basis as much as possible in a big church. Sometimes we, we say, hey, buddy. Hey, girl. Hey. And like, what was her name? And you can't remember. I know I struggle with that. And you may, maybe you struggle too. And so at every location on your seats is a name tag. And I'm inviting you, everybody in our services, put the, put your name, first name, just first name on there, put your name tag on. And over the next few weeks, we just want to get on a first name basis with everybody. Uh, Sound good, everyone? Hey, before we jump uh, back into um, some, just some, some housekeeping items and things, I want to celebrate something cool. Seven years ago, seven years ago, we launched our very first campuses. We thought we were going to launch Nacogdoches first, but the timeline was different. God called us to launch actually prison campuses first. And seven years ago, we launched in the Dieball unit. And then about a year and a half later, we launched in the Duncan unit. And God has been showing up uh, every week, every Wednesday night, uh, as we uh, replay the Sunday service for those guys, people getting saved and water baptized. And it's just a cool treat today for the 1130 service, 1130 service. Uh, A few weeks ago, a friend of mine uh, that had spent time at the Dieball unit said, hey, I'm going to bring some friends together. We all have been a part of Timber Creek and our prison system, and we just wanted, will you be there on August 4th? And I wasn't going to be. And I said, hey, I'm going to change my schedule. I'll be there, and and I'm here. And uh, nine or ten of them have come today. And guys, I know this is last second. Join me up here real quick. Give it up for these guys. Come right here, right in the middle, right in the middle, right in the middle. Come on, come on, come on. Come here, come tight, guys. Make two rows. Make make two rows like you're a choir. Like like it's Yes, we're gonna sing together. No, I don't want you to sing. I don't want you to do it. I've heard you sing. And let me tell you, it's some of the most beautiful singing I've ever heard. So guys, you've not been a church project. You're part of our church family. And as I've mentioned. From, from Charlie when he got out is now attending the Groves campus down in Beaumont. To our, uh, all the other guys, we, I mean, we rap together. I, I laid a beatbox down at a Christmas service with this one. Um, I've seen you guys grow and mature and follow Jesus. Um, two years out, one and a half years out, and God is showing up and they're being faithful. And guys, listen. The enemy comes in like a flood, but the the spirit of the Lord sets up a standard against that. Do not get too comfortable. The enemy wants to do nothing but steal, kill, and destroy you. Just like he wants to steal, kill, and destroy anybody else in here. Different, Different address, different situations, all issues. We all got them. But God gives mercy and grace new every single morning. And we are so thrilled that you're with us and joining us in service today. And I want to say to any of my Dieball and Duncan friends that when you get out, come say hi to us. Come say hi. We want to let us know you're here so we can serve you right. And let us be able to put a, a, a hand on your shoulder, a hug around your neck. And uh, would you just pray over our prison campuses? I believe God is calling us to launch more prison venues next year. Uh, We're pushing a pause on other campuses as we grow our campuses, but our prison venues, I believe God's put on our heart to to launch more. Um, And I believe as we reach the people that maybe have been forgotten to reach, God brings us uh, all the people that that we need to get the vision to happen. So let's just pray. Father, I pray for these men, and I thank you for them. And I pray that you would continue to bless them and keep them and make your face shine upon them. And that they would not be identified by their past, but they would look to you for their future. That they would walk in their identity of who you say they are. Uh, That their families, their children, their children's children uh, would see a change in their lives that they already have. And that would continue when they think it's on their own strength. 
Give them that clear picture that it is not by might nor by power, but by my spirit that they're gonna do the things they need to do to have the strength to accomplish what they need to accomplish, to live the way you've called them to live. We thank you for them. We pray blessings upon their houses and upon their futures and upon every person in our Die Ball and Duncan unit right now. We pray blessings over them, over uh, all of the employees at those prisons, and we pray, God, that you would continue to do what only you can do, and I pray for a renewal renewal, a spiritual renewal to take place through the prison houses in Texas. And we ask it in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. amen. Give it up for these guys. You can be seated. Head out that way, guys. In the meantime, look to the person next to you and say, man, you look good today. And you can have a seat. Hey, good morning, Timber Creek. We are so glad to get the opportunity to worship with you today. Hey, if this is your first time with us, we wanna have a huge welcome to you today. Thanks so much for investing part of your weekend with us. If you would take just a few moments and fill out that Connect card located in the seat back pocket in front of you or in the seat, uh, you can fill that out and drop that off in our buckets as they're being passed in just a few moments, or you can give it in our giving boxes out there in the lobby. Hey, at this time, we're gonna continue in worship with our giving. Uh, why do we give? Why is giving such an important thing? Uh, giving is our opportunity to say to God, we're putting you first in every area of our life. In fact, on the first Sunday of the month, it's a great opportunity for you to give for the first time or even re-engage in giving if it's been a little bit. I wanna encourage you to give as our offering is being received right now. You can give through the app, you can give online, or you can give in the giving boxes on the way out today. Now, for a few things that are coming up for you and your family, check it out. At Timber Creek Church, we believe that prayer is paramount. It is one of those disciplines that is a capstone for us. It's, it's a key moment for us as a church that we gather together and we seek the heart of God on behalf of our church, our community, and our world. In fact, two times a year, we meet together for 21 days of prayer. That begins tomorrow morning at every single one of our locations, Lufkin, 6 a.m. and 6 p.m., Nacogdoches, Groves, and Mount Enterprise. We're gonna meet at 6 a.m. in the morning for a, uh, an hour of prayer, worship, and devotion. You don't wanna miss it as we gear up for all things this fall. Let's put God first in our time of prayer. Hey, in two weeks, we have our big splash Sunday. Water baptism is one of those Sundays at Timber Creek Church that we love to celebrate. This is gonna be huge, everybody. This is our opportunity across all of our campuses for those of you that are, are ready to take a next step in your walk with Christ. Maybe you've been baptized before. Maybe you've never taken that next step of water baptism. Listen, this is the Sunday, two weeks from today, to get signed up and be a part of Big Splash Sunday. You can scan the QR code in your worship guide to sign up at any one of our campuses. Don't miss it, guys. Let's make this an incredible Splash Sunday. For more information on anything mentioned in the service today, you can scan the QR code right there in the bottom right-hand corner of your worship guide. Now, guys, let's stand together and let's continue in our time of worship. Come on, let's stand together. Let's lift our voice, Sam, for he's worthy, amen. I'll raise the hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I'll raise the hallelujah. See 
stand before you with our arms open, our minds open to hear your word, God. And as we kick off this series together, Lord, we pray that we are changed in your presence, God. Areas we need strengthening, Lord, Holy Spirit, be that strength to us. Lord, we need you to rest upon us, God. 
We love you, and we thank you. We pray it in the mighty name of Jesus. If you believe it, say amen. So be it in our lives. Amen. Let's give God some praise in this place, for he's worthy. Well, I'm excited to kick off this new series. You can grab a seat, take a look at the screens. Allow me to reintroduce myself. My name is... I'm sorry that I'm that 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 intro music is way too cool for what you get after that. I apologize. So uh, I wish you know. I was like, yo. Anyway, welcome in. So glad you're here. I want to kick it off by saying, if you know my wife, uh, she is a breath of fresh air wherever she goes. I, I I I love her. She is like the joy of the Lord is her strength. And something you'll also know about her when you get to know her is she is a absolute die-hard Dallas Cowboys fan, like just like hard core. And some of you, you just immediately opened up in prayer and others of you rejoiced. I get it. Um, this is usually how her season starts. Let's go then. How about them Cowboys? This is usually how her season ends. Uh, this was at a playoff game and those are not staged. Those are absolute moments. And, uh, she is a, she grew up in a diehard Cowboys family, and she will continue to this day. Now, I grew up in Kansas. I grew up a uh, Kansas City Chiefs fan. And in October last year, thanks, Mom. Mom's in here. Woo! And uh, uh, last year, uh, our board, uh, Pastor Appreciation, and our, our team got us some uh, Kansas City Chiefs tickets and for me and Janet. We went to a Thursday night game. It was so cool. What a great gift. And Janet was a good sport. Now, she's not going to be unfaithful to her team. I'm just going to tell you right now. But she's still dressed up. Now, she didn't, she wasn't having it. She wasn't having it. But she, she at least dressed up in the, in, the, in the red and yellow. And then uh, we got to enjoy that game together. And as I was taking it all in, because it had been a long time since I had been at uh, Arrowhead Stadium, uh, I'm enjoying it all. And, and Janet was getting into it, too. And, and I, I, I looked over about a few you know, minutes into the first quarter, and I noticed she was even taking pictures, but as I looked closer, I noticed it wasn't even on the field. She was like, she had her phone into the stands, and I'm like, what is going on? Later to find out, she had spotted Taylor Swift, okay. So like, I mean, here's the issue. Same field, same team, same sport that we both love, but in that moment, we, I knew we both had very different perspectives, okay? Um, when you understand perspective, there can be an artistry perspective, there can be mentally and emotionally perspective, there can be relational perspective, basically depth and distance. Uh, that's a perspective of painting and a depth and a distance. She had a depth and knowledge to the Cowboys that she did not have to the Chiefs, a distance in relation to where you grow up and who you grow up around, um, the mental attitude. I mean, she is on the coffee table ready to go every Sunday. Don't get it twisted. Like, she will record it, but don't you dare tell her the results before she watches it because that's when her joy is not, like, her joy becomes incomplete, okay? And then relational understanding. There's just like relationship between, I'm not going to make fun of the Cowboys when they lose. I just got a relational understanding uh, there and, and vice versa. Now, here's how we're going to tie it in. As we start a series on, hello, my name is Holy Spirit. There's a whole lot of different perspective when I even say the name Holy Spirit. And so how do we start in a church that more than likely, there's a whole lot of different starting points. There's a whole lot of different perspectives. There's, a, there's an excitement like, good team, when, it's some, when I say Holy Spirit. Others of you are like, good boy, is this where they pull out the snakes, okay? That's Thursday, that's not today, okay. So really, the, the, the fundamental starting point is for all of us to be on the same page to have the right perspective. And so let's do a little poll of all of our locations real quick. Um, how many of you, you'd say, um, I grew up in church. I, I grew up in church. Not every week, but you grew up. Okay, okay. How many of you with a raise of hand say, I really didn't grow up in church? 
wow, I love that. We're like a church anyone can come to. We're not just for those that just grew up in church. Like, I'm so glad that you are uh, expanding your experience with who Jesus is through this local church context. For those of you that did grow up in church, though, how many of you grew up like maybe a Catholic or Episcopalian? Anybody? Okay, a few in the audience here in, in the Lufkin location there in Knack and Groves and Mount Enterprise and Dival and Duncan and Iglesia. Okay, how many of you grew up more like a Methodist, a Presbyterian, Lutheran? Anybody? All right. Um, how many of you grew up like Pentecostal, Pentecostal Holiness, United Pentecostal, Assembly of God, Church of God in Christ, Church of God? Anybody? Okay, okay, okay. Um, how many of you uh, grew up Baptist? Oh, dear Lord, there they are. There they are. Look at you hooping and hollering and raising your hands, all you Baptists, okay? <laughs> oh, yeah, see, that's more, that's, that's more hooping and hollering and hand raising than you Baptists have ever done right there. How many of you just haven't grown up yet? You just haven't grown up, okay, yeah. Now, now here's the deal. Here's the deal. With all of that, there are some that leaned into the Holy Spirit, others that leaned away, depending upon denomination, depending upon uh, region, depending upon even the slant and the bend of that particular denominational church. And so where do we want to start today? First, I want to say to you this. Can we enter, over the next few weeks, can we enter into a conversation and an introduction into Holy Spirit that doesn't start with your denominational history or your already formed opinions and views. Is it possible that we could simply go back to the word of God as the foundation for every decision we make, the moral compass for every decision, uh, the moral compass uh, and, and, and our belief structure? Can we go back to the word of God? Let's go there as the starting point regardless of how you grew up, number one. Number two, when we begin to talk about the Holy Spirit, Regardless of your bend towards let's go or oh no, um, if you can wrap your mind around a heaven and a hell, if you can wrap your mind around a virgin birth, if you can wrap your mind around the son of the living God leaving heaven for earth, living a sinless life, dying a death in your place, ascending 40 days later after his resurrection to prepare a place for you that when he comes back in the second coming, he'll receive all, like if you can wrap your mind around that, could you wrap your mind around that a supernatural kingdom requires supernatural power? That there could be more than you may not even be aware of. And my goal is not to get you to uh, experience something over these next few weeks, but for you to more deeply know someone over these next few weeks. So the right perspective as we start, if you're taking notes, this is going to be a sprint. I mean, we're gonna drink from the fire hose today. So <clears throat> stretch that pin out, here we go. Here's the wrong perspective that where we should start. Here, here's even a slanted wrong perspective. The wrong perspective is this. I'm a physical being on a spiritual journey. You, you'll hear people talk about their spiritual journey. That, that is not, that's the wrong perspective. That you're a physical being on a temporary spiritual journey. Here's the right perspective. You are a spiritual being made in the image of God. There is something supernatural and spiritual that's going to live forever. You have a temporary physical life. A temporary physical body that once it's done, you still live on. Your spirit is eternal. And so there's, there's something that even that slight shift of knowing, made in the image of God, I'm designed for something supernatural. Just to have that perspective is so important. Now let me take you a, a little step further and say Jesus in the book of Luke, here's what he says to his disciples. He's been living with them, showing them things, um, feeding thousands, walking on water, raising the dead, healing the sick, opening blind eyes. And out of all of that incredible good gifts of his grace and his presence there, here's what he says to them. He says, and now if you, though you're evil, like you're not perfect, you at least know how to give good gifts to your children. How many of you ever received a, a gift from someone and it was like, man, they knew you so well. They were so thoughtful. That meant so much. Uh, it's like, man, they had me. Anybody ever received a gift like that? That's pretty awesome. How many of you ever received a gift from someone and it was like, what were they thinking? Do they even know me? I would never wear that. I would never do that. I would never whatever, okay? Like, like um, 
Jesus knows you, and he's got a good gift. Now, if you, you're not perfect, you know how to still give pretty good gifts to your kids, how much more, more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? How much more, like if, if you do a decent job, if you know what it's like to receive and give a good gift, how much more will he give a good gift of the Holy Spirit? So write this down. The greatest gift to the lost of humanity, those that haven't bowed a knee to Jesus, if you've not invited Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, friend, listen, you may have some theories, but you're lost. You're lost. The only way to, to truly know where you're going is to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. See, it's the only guarantee for life on this side of heaven and the other side. The greatest gift to the lost is salvation. And salvation is nothing you could ever earn. It's not what you do, it's what he has done. So it's very simple to receive it. Why? Because if it was hard to receive, it'd be on your works, not his work. So here's how you receive it. For God so loved the world, he sent his only son, that whosoever believes in him, who he is and what he's done, they have eternal life. The greatest gift to the lost is salvation. But Jesus himself says the greatest gift to the saved, for those that have bowed a knee and believe, is the Holy Spirit. It's the greatest gift to those that have decided to follow Jesus. So, Paul says in 1 Corinthians, concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I don't want you to be ignorant. And, and in the next few weeks, we'll talk about even spiritual gifts, but what I wanna focus on, which many times we get the focus on the wrong thing, we get the focus on the gifts versus the focus on the gift giver, he's the greatest gift, just the person and the work of the Holy Spirit in us and through us, and we can get really excited and pom-poms in our hands on all the gifts, which are important, but not, they shouldn't supersede the actual personal intimate relationship that we have with the person of the Holy Spirit. And Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant, and, and I, I want us to be on the same page with the right perspective, moving forward, palms up, ready to receive all that Jesus has for us. Now, if there's more for you to receive as a Christ follower, and Jesus says there's more, have you been open to receive all he has for you? It's kind of where we want to start today. But in order to get to that point, I know that I can't just jump in and force feed you. What I want to do is, is take a Holy Spirit sprint and know that the most common place we see the Holy Spirit is in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, when the Holy Spirit is poured out on the day of Pentecost and they speak in different languages and thousands of people come to Christ and the church is birthed that day. But in order to get there, many times that's all we know. So I want to take you through a sprint through the Bible to get back to that point and where we are today and what it means for you and I in 2024. Sound good, everybody? So here we go, the Holy Spirit sprint. Let's start with number one. I'm gonna take you on 11 different destinations. Here's the first destination. The Holy Spirit is present at creation. He doesn't just show up in the New Testament in the book of Acts. The Bible says, in fact, we sang a song about it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Like a, like a helicopter that hovers close to the grass and it moves and it, it, and it changes the, the, the look of what's behind it and the, it, it blows that wind. The Holy Spirit was, was hovering there. When we are made, God says, let's make man in our image. And there, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, all together, there is the beginning of life. Number two, we see the Holy Spirit present through the prophets. Now, through the Old Testament, we see prophets like Isaiah and Ezekiel and Nehemiah, and uh, we see uh, uh, like uh, um, the different minor prophets, Haggai and, and Habakkuk. We see all these different prophets. What was a prophet? It was a chosen person anointed by the Spirit of God to speak the truth of God and speak the word of God to a people that desperately needed it. They had ran from God, and they, they would, God would raise up specific people with, a, with the voice of God to be the trumpet, the mouthpiece of God to people. And we see a pattern in all of the prophets of how God raises them up. And here's, here's that pattern. There would be a prophet and they would see something and hear something and feel something and then be called to speak something. All these prophets throughout the Old Testament and the New 
to saw, heard, felt, and spoke. Well, so let's start with this deliverer who's anointed by God. His name is Moses. And Moses in Exodus is called of God. He's going to lead the people of Israel out of slavery. They've been slavery for 400 years. He's going to lead them out. And here's what happens. He saw a burning bush. He hears God speaking through this bush. The feelings are he's holy ground. He takes his feet off and there's like something powerful about even the the, the ground he's standing on. The signs that God gives him, there's something that he can actually feel and understand from leprosy to the staff that is in his own hand that he's holding. And the Bible says that when it came to speak, God says, hey, I'm going to empower you to speak to the people. And Moses is afraid of it. Moses is afraid, I I, I don't have what it takes. God says, no, 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 no. I'm going to empower you to speak my message to the culture that I'm calling you to reach. That's Moses. In Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah has a vision and he sees the Lord in his temple. The, The robe of the Lord was so big it filled the entire temple. And he hears God speaking and an angel says, who will go for us? And 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 Isaiah says, I'll go. And, and so they put a hot coal out of the, 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 the sacrifice, sacrificial like uh, fire there. And they put a hot coal on his lips. And instead of hurting him, it, like it empowers him. And he's empowered to speak on behalf of God. Later in the book of Ezekiel, chapters 1, 2, and 3, Ezekiel has a vision. He sees uh, not earth, wind, and fire. That's a whole different thing. Uh, he sees heaven, wind, and fire. It's all that, so, so you kind of catalog that in the back of your brain, uh, heaven and wind and, and fire. And he hears the word of the Lord spoken to him, and he feels this weight on him, this weightiness on him, but then he's lifted by the Holy Spirit. That, that, that the Lord wants to show the people of God something. He wants to lift them out of their, out of their chains. And what is he going to speak? The Bible says, I'm going to put the scroll in your mouth. In other words, my words are going to go in your mouth, and you're going to speak the message to the culture I've placed you in with power. So we see this through the prophets. We could show you some more, but for the sake of time, let's keep going. The Holy Spirit now There is a change in relationship with God that's going to be prophesied by Joel. Up to this point, God had only selected one at a time to be the mouthpiece and the instrument. Even out of tribes, there was only certain tribes that were allowed to be the kind of priests that would work inside the temple. Not everybody could just go into the temple. Only the Levites had the authority and responsibility to step into and be separated. And, but, but Joel is getting a vision from God, and he, there's a change in relationship coming. This is 700 years before Jesus is born uh, on, on, on earth. And Joel says, God says through Joel, I'm going to pour out my spirit on who people? Oh, come on. Come on, everybody. I'll pour my spirit out on who people? All people. There's a shift coming, a relationship change. I'm going to pour out my spirit on, on, on all people. And I mean, your sons and your daughters. So male or female, doesn't matter. They're going to prophesy. Your old men, doesn't matter how old wisdom, uh, how young, lack of wisdom, like I'm going to give wisdom supernaturally. Old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. So it's not about just like the chief elder. It could be anybody. He says, even on my servants, so even social economically, even your status or your stature, doesn't matter, doesn't matter. You don't have to have a pedigree. Even on my servants, both men and women, I'm going to pour out my spirit in those days, days that are coming in the future. So what do we hear from Joel's prophecy? In, if you read more in that chapter beyond what I just read in scripture, you see that he, there's a new wine and a new harvest coming, like a harvest that needs to be harvested. A new wine, a new relationship It's going to be happening. He hears God's voice through anyone. It's going to be dreams and prophecies and visions through anyone. Anyone? Anyone. He feels this hopefulness and this unashamed. There's a lifting of Joel because he's in the middle of a very depraved Israeli culture that has ran from God. Do you know, you and I, we are just one generation away from a nation and a family that does not know God. One generation away. It happened in the Bible several times. They, they lived, they died, and the next generation came, and they did not know who God was because it wasn't handed down and wasn't understood. 
But they're going to speak in Joel's prophecy. They're going to speak of the goodness of God. They're not going to be empowered to, to point a crooked finger and say, y'all just going to hell. Like hell is too consonant. You know, it's like, it's like hey, y'all. It's actually good news. It's gospel. Gospel means good news. The goodness of God to his people. You're going to be empowered. Sure enough, after a few more prophets, we get to the very end of the Old Testament and the final book of the Old Testament is Malachi. If you're Italian, it's Malachi. Joke. Pastor joke. Malachi ends, and in your written Bible, in your, in your physical Bible, 99.9% um, .9 of the time, you'll see blank page in between the Old Testament and the New Testament. That's a symbol of a silence that happens. The 400 years of silence that we don't have a record of anyone speaking, hearing, seeing, feeling. It doesn't mean that it didn't happen. It just means that we don't have a record in our word of God of anything happening. And we get to the next phase of this sprint to 700 years later, the opening scenes of the New Testament. And in the opening scenes of the New Testament, in the gospel according to Luke, Luke introduces us to another priest named Zechariah. Zechariah is going to be an uncle of, of Jesus. And Zechariah is a priest, and he has been authorized because he's in a certain uh, tribe. He has access to go into the holier of holies in the temple. And it's his responsibility to go in there, and we, we see that when he goes in as the priest, there's something amazing that happens. He sees the angel Gabriel, and he hears the angel speak, and there's a promise of good news coming. There's promise of good news coming. Backstory, Zachariah has been married to Elizabeth for many, many years, decades, and they've been barren. They've not been able to have children. And now there's this promise of a new child, and this child is going to bring forth uh, some powerful things, including the uh, announcement of the Messiah to come. Their son is going to be John the Baptist. But, but, but here's what happens. Zachariah feels fear and uncertainty the same way that Moses felt fear and uncertainty. But on this occasion, instead of being empowered to speak, God chooses to show us something that in Zechariah, he couldn't speak until the promise came. There was almost like a, a shutdown, like you've not been able to speak and you're not. And there's like a symbolism here that there's been this inability to speak the message of God to the people. But the promise is coming. And it wasn't until the birth of John the Baptist that Zechariah, who became mute at that moment, when his son is finally born, he's able to speak again. And here we get to John the Baptist, his son. The Holy Spirit is promised by John. We read about that in the, in the book of Matthew. John's saying, I'm going to baptize you with water for repentance, uh, for a change of heart. When you get baptized, I'm going to baptize you that way. You're churning your face towards God. But after me, though, I'm not like the end-all, be-all, but after me, one who's more powerful than I, whose uh, Birkenstocks and sliders and, and, and chanclas I am not worthy to carry, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. He is talking about Jesus. And a few months later, Jesus will come and be baptized by John. The Holy Spirit will descend like a dove onto Jesus, and he will be empowered then to speak the message. And Jesus, the divine Son of God, is the next phase of the Holy Spirit. Because in the ministry years of Jesus, even Jesus himself refers to the Holy Spirit. I mean, we already read about it in Luke at the very beginning of our message that how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Notice that it's Jesus talking about his Father in heaven who will give not just of himself, but will give actually the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is three, one, one God in three different character traits, three different persons, three different persons. Jesus will live his life. He will walk on water, raise the dead, heal the sick. And we get to the final moments of Jesus' physical life. Number seven, the Holy Spirit at the Last Supper. Now, you're in the final moments of your life. Every word matters. Jesus is not just like, I don't know what y'all want to talk about today. You want to talk about, you know, the cowboys? Like, no, he, he is incredibly intentional in these moments because he is understanding the weight of what's about to happen. 
and he prays over unity and he washes their feet and he says, this is how we do this. We serve. We don't lord it over. We serve people. It's not about the power of, of just government. It's the power of, of what I want to give to you. That's going to be the power, not this power. My kingdom isn't just this kingdom. You can get power in this kingdom, but I'm talking about a different kingdom. And he's talking to them about these things. And here's what he says at the Last Supper. He says, I'm going to pray the Father and he's going to give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. Now, let me show that to you. And I, Jesus, will pray, or that word just basically means ask. When you pray, you're asking, you're talking. And I will ask the Father, so Jesus will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper. That other helper is the Holy Spirit. He may abide with you forever. And so this is why, this is one of the anchor scriptures of why we believe a God, uh, one God in three persons. And so maybe you grew up saying it's, it's Jesus and Jesus only. And, 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 and this is something that I would invite you to uh, wrestle with in how Jesus himself communicates these realities. He says, these things I've spoken to you while being present with you, but the, whole, the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. Three, three, three different people doing different things. He's going to teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Pause. Do you understand how important this scripture is right here? Some of you have struggled like how, I mean, how do we know that these authors of the Bible were really speaking everything that happened? Why didn't they just make it up? Like how, I can't, I can barely remember what I ate last Wednesday. I can't remember. I, I'm sure it was too much and way too much calories, but I can't give you the specifics on that. How could they give us the specifics on all these things? Because it wasn't just authors. It was authors empowered by the Holy Spirit. I'm going to teach you and I'm going to bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. There was something divinely supernatural about the giving of God's word through these very normal, dysfunctional people. But empowered by the Spirit, it changes everything. Jesus goes on to talk about several other things. And it's like, have you ever had a conversation with someone and they keep reminding you to make, just, just make sure that this happens and talk about other things? And, but, but, but did I tell you that I, I need to make sure that this happens? This is Jesus on the, last, on the night of the Last Supper. He talks for a while. A couple chapters later, he says, no, 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 listen, 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 Linda. I'll tell you the truth. I'm telling you, it's to your advantage that I go away. I'm not telling you about this sweet little thing called the Holy Spirit that gives you goosebumps in the service. No, no, no. It's to your advantage that I go away. Some of you, your kids are about ready to start back school. Wouldn't it be awesome? You pull up to, to, to sixth grade, your little middle school, or how could they be in middle school already? And, and you say, hey, I love you, praying for you. It's going to be a great day. You're going to be a champion. Keep your hand in the hand of Jesus. And when you look in the rear view mirror, they're getting out of the side of, of, of the car, and Jesus is in the seat with them and looks in the mirror and he goes, and he gets out and walks little Emily into sixth grade class just like this hand in hand, wouldn't you feel better as a parent? Man, wouldn't we feel better sitting, having a little spat with the spouse and you go into the living room and Jesus is sitting there watching the chiefs and, and uh, he, you know, and you say, hey, Jesus, we've been having this little argument and he says, hey, hey, hey. Here's, here's, what, here's what I would recommend. Wouldn't you love Jesus to help settle a dispute? I, you know, probably, he, just to be honest with you, he's probably gonna join with your wife. Just, just get over it. Anyway, all these things are going on. He's saying, it's to your advantage because I can't be everywhere at once when I'm in the flesh. So what I'm gonna give you is the Holy Spirit in you, through you, around you, empowering you so that your kids can walk hand in hand with me. May not be physically, Spiritually, that's the kind of relationship I want with every person. Every boardroom can have the Holy Spirit in that meeting. Every conversation in your marriage can have the Holy Spirit in that conversation. It is to your advantage. For if I don't go away, the helper won't come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Sure enough, that night, he is betrayed. He is taken to six different trials overnight, underground, in disguise, because... That's the only way they could get what they wanted. Peter, one of his closest friends, in one moment will defend him in the garden and cut off a guy's ear. In another moment, he'll deny him completely three times and will fulfill what Jesus even said, that before the rooster would crow, you'll deny me three times. He didn't have any power. He, he was afraid. He was uncertain. And in that moment where he could have stood up for his rabbi, he ran away and cried bitterly. That night, 
He's betrayed, he's tried, he's found guilty of blasphemy. He's beaten within an inch of his life. He takes the road up to Golgotha. He's crucified between two common criminals. And the disciples are watching their rabbi die. The guy who walked on water, the guy who called Lazarus out of a tomb, and he's dead. And they're afraid that they might be next. And so they all go and for fear that they might be next, they hide. They, they dim the kerosene lamps in a little house. They, they shut the drapes. They deadbolt the door. And they wait for what's next. Three days later, though, we get to the day of the resurrection. And Jesus does rise again. And he finds them where they are. And the Bible says that Jesus came and stood among them. I mean, that's a moment. Like, it didn't say he knocked on the door, gave him the password. It's not, I mean, he just like whoo, shows up. Nathaniel's drinking his Starbucks. <laughs> Bartholomew passes out on the coffee table. You know, Andrew's playing kumbaya on the guitar. He's like, Pring, breaks a string. Jesus shows up. Now, if you've been dead three days and haven't been around and you show up right out like through the wall, like you got you to kind of calm everybody down. He says, peace be with you, okay? Like, peace be with you. He has to say it twice. And here's what happens next. And with that, he breathed on them and said, everybody say it out loud, all locations. Receive the Holy Spirit. Now, where in scripture have we heard of a God breathing on them? Not many places. When you rewind all the way to the very beginning, when man is born, when humanity is born, we read that God takes the dust and he breathes life and creates humanity. That's our birth moment. For the disciples, they had had Jesus all their life, all their three and a half years. And now what is happening? This is their born again moment. This is where they go from just followers of Jesus in the flesh to they receive and believe in faith and they receive the Holy Spirit and they are saved. And the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead now at salvation dwells in them. That's their born again moment. When you ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, you are inviting the breath of God to breathe life into your soul and birth you again. And the Holy Spirit's with you. But the story doesn't stop there. There's more to the story. Because for 40 days, Jesus is around them. And for 40 days, he's going to hang out. And then he's going to ascend into heaven. But before the ascension, during those 40 days, Luke captures it in Acts chapter 1. After his suffering, so after the, uh, the, the crucifixion, he showed himself to these men. He gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days, and he spoke about the kingdom of God. It goes on to say that on one occasion, while he was eating with them, this isn't the moment where he shows up and says, peace be with you. He's eating with them. And he says this, don't leave Jerusalem but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. Time out, time out, time out. But at salvation, they already got the Holy Spirit. He already breathed on them, the Holy Spirit. So why would Jesus ask them to wait for something they already received? Maybe there is something more that Jesus had for them. According to scripture, there is. He says, John baptized with water. In a few days, you're going to be baptized, immersed, like covered up with the Holy Spirit. So let's recap. The Holy Spirit is present at creation. He is experienced through the prophets. There's a prophecy of a change in relationship by Joel. He is promised by John the Baptist. Jesus said, it's to your advantage that you would want a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Jesus says that he breathes the Holy Spirit life on them on Resurrection Sunday. Uh, he tells them to seek more at the ascension. And sure enough, that's exactly what those disciples do. And a few days later, a few days later, we get to number 10, and the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, a few days later. Now, pause. The Jews would be gathering around this, the, the, the temple because Pentecost simply means 50. 
and it was the Feast of Tabernacles, and the Jewish people celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, and they also celebrate Moses receiving the Ten Commandments on this day of Pentecost. Now, if you rewind into our series that we just finished up a few weeks ago on the Ten Commandments, you'll remember that they were 400 years slaves. God raises up a deliverer named Moses. He empowers him. He comes in with signs and wonders and convincing proofs, and Pharaoh... <clears throat> begrudgingly lets the people go. They release after Passover, which was the final plague where, where the, the Lord passes over and those that had blood on their doorposts, their family was saved. But if you didn't have the blood of a sacrificed lamb on your doorpost, the oldest son would die. 400 years a slave. Pharaoh is in charge of the enemy of darkness. Uh, Moses comes to deliver them. There's Passover. Now the holy day, they're gonna celebrate Passover. 50 days after Passover is when they celebrate the receiving of the Ten Commandments. Now, what happens on that day? Moses, Moses comes down the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments on tablets, and they couldn't wait. They just couldn't wait. They made their own God. But in the New Testament, we will see that the disciples, after 400 years of silence, God doesn't raise up another prophet. God sends his own son. And with many convincing proofs, he shows himself to them. Then he, instead of the firstborn dying, if you don't cover your doorpost, the one and only son dies for everybody. And instead of receiving the law of how to live in tablets that are broken because nobody can keep them perfectly, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit is going to come and it's going to be a new law. It's going to be walking by the Spirit that the spirit of the Lord, the, the law of the Lord would be, would be on our hearts, not on tablets of stone. All these different things that are coming together. And sure enough, on this day, they were all together in one place and suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. These are the same believers that received the Holy Spirit. They were now filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in other tongues. This is not a prayer language that's unrecognizable by men, but only by God. This is a different languages of different tribes. Um, those are two different things. And we'll talk about that in a few weeks of what's the difference between the Holy Spirit prayer language and this miracle of like language of a different culture as the Spirit enabled them. So here's the prophet now. It's all of them. It's not just one of them, it's all of them. And what do we see? We see something like fire. Now, when I was growing up, this is what I saw. I was like, oh, I don't know if I want that, you know? Something like fire, rushing wind, their own language on the street. The house is filled with wind, very similar to the different things that we're seeing and experiencing and feeling all throughout the Old Testament. And what happens? They speak Jesus to the culture. Let me tell you what Pentecost is and isn't. Pentecost is not about speaking in tongues. It's not about speaking in language with a miracle. Here's what it's really all about. It's about being empowered by the Holy Spirit to speak the message of Jesus with boldness through a culture that's so chaotic and crazy, but to speak it with clarity that people on the street say, whoa, what does this mean? I wanna know more about this. That's the essence of what being spirit-filled and empowered by the spirit is all about. And as they do this, here's the response of the crowd. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what, what, what does this even mean? And it doesn't even stop there. Some, however, made fun of them and said, they've, had been too, you know, they've been drinking back on grandpa's old cough medicine. Now, can I show you that? Even in today's culture, when it comes to the Holy Spirit, some of you are amazed, some of you are perplexed, Maybe some of you have been like, that, that's goofy, that's not for me. You've been skeptical, you've even made fun. But the real question we need to ask is like, what does this truly mean? And Peter, who would deny him 50 days earlier, will stand with boldness from the Holy Spirit. And what happens? Peter gives that Joel's prophecy. There's gonna be a new wine and harvest and God's voice through anyone and hopeful and unashamed and it's the goodness of God and even though we crucified him, he loves you and he has a, a plan and this is for everybody and when every pe person heard this, they were cut to the heart and they said to Peter and the other apostles, what should we do? What should we do about all this? And Peter replies, 
He says, well, repent, change your ways, be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, and you're gonna receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then he goes on to say, now the promise of the Holy Spirit, that gift is for you and your children, and for who? All who are where? For all whom the Lord our God will call. For all whom our Lord will call. That means it's for everybody. It didn't just stop there. And do you know that when the Israelites in the wilderness, they couldn't wait, they made their own God, they made the golden calf, Moses comes down, breaks the commandments, and he calls the priests together, the Levites, and he says, punishment is on them. And that day, the Levites go through the camp and they kill people, men, women, children. It's a bloody mess. Do you know how many people died that day? 3,000 people died that day by the sword. But on the day of Pentecost, they're cut to the heart. There's something inside happening. And they had waited and they had heard. And when they responded, 3,000 people were added to the church that day. It was as if it was a clean slate and a new way to live. I finish with this. Several years later, several years later, I'm, not, I'm, I'm talking about maybe 20, 25 years. Paul is on the scene. He's been empowered by the Holy Spirit. And Paul is on a trip and he traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus. He was on the coast where he found several believers. Now remember, how do you get saved? God so loved the world, he sent his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. It's about you believing. It's not about anything else. It's not about you uh, receiving a certain thing. It's not about having to be baptized. Otherwise, it would be about you. And it's not even about what the pastor says outside of the water tank. So many people get caught up on Father, Son, Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Like, you're under the water. It's your soul. What if the pastor got it wrong? You raise up. You didn't know if he said in Jesus' name only or if he said Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You show up to heaven. You've been living his life. Like, ah, he didn't quite say it this way. So, Well, then it's all about how the pastor says it, whether you're saved or not. That's not right. It's about what Jesus has done. It's all about the sacrifice of Jesus, period. And you got to believe that. And if you put it in other men's voices, if you put it on this, all these other steps to take, then it's all about you and you've missed it. It's the greatest gift, salvation, but it's the starting point. But he's found these believers who put their faith in Christ. And Paul says, hey, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Well, of course they did. But they're seeing it a little different because the Holy Spirit had been poured out in a different way. And they, they reply, no, we, di we didn't receive the Holy Spirit when we believed. As a matter of fact, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And I wonder if maybe... You've been living for Jesus. His spirit is inside of you. But when it comes to more of a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit, maybe you haven't even heard. That's where they were. So friends, if that's you, will you join me for the next few weeks and allow me to reintroduce to you the greatest person you'll ever know. As we end today, we go back to that moment on Pentecost and Peter says, this promise is for you and your children, for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. It's for all who are far off and we're far off and it's for all who are in this service right now in all of our locations. And as we end, I want you to take that little box in your notes and let's make this personal now. It's me right now. And here are the four elements that I wanna invite you into today. Would you ask these four questions? As we jump into 21 days of prayer, for us to disconnect from our normal schedules and take time to truly connect with God in a deeper way, school years start, listen, you need this and this church needs, we need everybody praying and believing together for what God wants to do through this church. It, it can't just live on my prayers for Timber Creek or our deacon team's prayers or our staff. Like we all need to be praying and here's the direction I wanna give us for this 21 days of prayer as we start tomorrow. We'd ask, Holy Spirit, what do you wanna show me? Holy Spirit, what do you wanna to say to me? 
Holy Spirit, how do you want to reach me? And it's not until we get through those that we say, what do you want to say through me? We got a whole lot of Christians misrepresenting the person of the Holy Spirit by talking on behalf of God, having not waited to hear from God. And we need the Holy Spirit's wisdom and power and comfort and guidance to speak his message through the chaos with clarity to a culture that desperately needs it. So I want to invite all of our locations to stand. I'm going to ask our prayer teams to come to the front. Um, we're going to end in a time of worship. I'm not dismissing you yet. I'm asking you to respect the Holy Spirit, actually, and hang tight and give him his due. Give him his worship he's due. But as our prayer teams are coming forward, our new here team is going to be over on my right. During this time of worship, if you're new and you'd like to Ask a question to us about taking the next step at Timber Creek. We'd love to meet you. Follow Jesus team is over here. If you're saying, I, I, I want Jesus in my life. I, I want him on the throne of my heart. We'd love to give you a Bible, help you take a next step. You can meet our follow Jesus team. If there's anything you'd like prayer over during the time of worship, we're gonna take the next three minutes and we're gonna sing this song. Would you lean in now? And those questions, what to hear, to feel, to speak, to, to experience. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Holy Spirit, you're meeting us here. Will we lean into you today? Come on, let's sing this together at all locations. And Holy Spirit, come rest on us. You're all we want. You're all we want. Holy Spirit, come rest on us. You're all we want, we say. The Holy Spirit, come rest on us. You're all we want. You're all we want. The Holy Spirit, come rest on us. You're all we want. You're all we want. We cry. just kind of wading in 
We're going to go a little deeper next week. We're going to take some next steps. We're, we're going to unpack this relationship one story at a time, one layer at a time. But I want you to know he is not a vague electrical force field that's designed to accidentally run into when you hit a, a good, powerful worship service. He's a person you can know intimately. He didn't come to put on a circus show at the church or just kind of entertain us. The Holy Spirit is to empower us because this culture he loves very, very much. And he would love to empower you to be his voice to the culture. But before you start with the culture, before you start with Facebook, start here with your own heart. Start with your family. Let's lean into creating an environment of welcoming the Holy Spirit in our homes this week. And let's see what God does. I love you. Again, new here team, follow Jesus team, prayer team. We're here to meet you right where you are if you'd like to take a moment. In the meantime, may the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you. God bless you, everybody. See you next Sunday.